Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to start off with our panel on high-tech solutions. So grab a seat. We've got a lot of great information to share with you in a very short amount of time. My name is Christopher Lee. I am the chair. I'm with IWP, the International Association for Professional Accessibility, and it is great to be here today. Um, we've got great panelists. We're going to start off. The structure is going to be we're going to do some brief introductions. We're going to ask name and organizations to each of the panelists. And then we're going to ask them one takeaway that they want you to have before leaving this panel. Um, then we'll open it up to the presentations. And we're going to start fall to my left with Alvin. Great. Thanks, Chris. Right. Uh, my name is Alvin. I'm from SG Enable. It's an agency in Singapore that empowers persons with disabilities. So, um, well, for the takeaway, I would say that personally, I'm a believer in technology for good. So in terms of takeaway, I strongly believe that assistive technology can help persons with disabilities and that we should push more for the adoption of the technology. Right. Over to the next speaker. Thank you. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Shitega Kasuki. I'm very happy to meet you all here today. I come from Japan, and I'm deaf, as you can see. I work with deaf and hard of hearing people uh, and to give them access to TV programs. Thanks a lot. Odessa? My name is Modesta Nurenda. I am uh, sitting here for Solar Ear Global, based in Botswana. Uh, the one takeaway is that we all need affordable hearing, and planning for disability is planning for all. Thank you, Francesca. Ciao, I'm Francesca Fedeli. I'm the co-founder of Fight the Stroke. It's a social enterprise based in Italy, but with a global approach. We are taking care of the needs of all of the 17 millions of kids and their family with cerebral palsy. So my takeaway is that uh, thanks to technology nowadays, uh, we can leave these families with uh, someone uh, dealing with a cerebral palsy with hope. Thank you, Francesca. Um, so we're going to start off with our presentations. Um, Alvin's going to start off first. We have 10 minutes for each presenter. Um, then we'll open it up to questions afterwards. Um, Alvin, take it away. Right, I just get me everything started. OK, right. Great. Right. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elvin. I'm from SG Enable. So I'm here today to share with you the work that we do, and in particular about TechAble, which is a center for assistive technology based in Singapore that empowers persons with disability through the use of technology. I think I'll be keeping this short. All right. So um, besides an overview about SG Enable and TechAble, I'm going to share a little bit about the impact that we have delivered through the operation in TechAble. And I'll also be sharing some of the um, initiatives, some of the efforts that we have undertaken in raising awareness and to drive innovation in the assistive technology domain. And last of all, we will just share about some of the next steps for TechAble. All right, so first off, I'll just share with you a bit more about SG Enable. So we run various programs to empower persons with disabilities. So one of which is information and referral services, where we share information and provide some advisory uh, to persons with disabilities, and we also um, administer some financial schemes to help them along, such as um, transportation subsidies and also subsidies to purchase assistive technology devices, amongst others. Right, and secondly, about training employment, which is one of the key mandate of uh, SG Enable. We work with both persons with disabilities as well as employers to create this ecosystem where, everyone to, uh, where employers will be more open to employ persons with disabilities. So on this note, we work from both spectrums. We upskill the person with disabilities, providing them with the skills to take on the job opportunities. And we work with the employers in terms of uh, raising their awareness about inclusive hiring and helping them equip them with the uh, capabilities to do so. Right? And thirdly, 
as you enable also administer, sorry, uh, you also manage a space called the enabling village. So it's, it's pretty much an inclusive and barrier-free facility where we encourage persons with and without disabilities to come together in this space and interact with each other. So to, so to this end, actually, we also run programs to encourage more community inclusion. And last but not least, we also aim to meet the emergent needs of persons with disabilities. To achieve this, we form strategic partnerships with uh, partners in the various sectors, and uh, we also support the uh, ground initiatives to help them along. So, like, for example, through the use of grants, which I'll cover a little bit more later. And now, a bit more about Tech Able. So, we are an integrated assistive technology space, and it's located within the Enabling Village. Together with another non-profit organization that we work with, SPD, we provide the assessment and training services to persons with disabilities. And besides these services, the centre also serves as a showcase of technology. So any of the stakeholders, be it the person with disability themselves, their caregivers, educators, therapists, they are welcome to come to our centre and take a look for themselves, what are the, all the various kinds of devices that are out there. Right? And we also serve as a physical space to gather the like-minded people to come together to innovate and create new products for persons with disabilities. And last of all, we, are, we also house a communication lab which provides training to upscale the person with disabilities. So TechAble is formed out of a people, public and private partnership. So in other words, besides um, fun some funding from the government, we are also open to funding from the private sectors to help to operationalize the place. So uh, as, a, as a result, we are not a revenue generating center per se. So we are using, uh, using all these funds to offset the operation costs. So why did we set up this center? Actually, the center is quite new. Uh, we are only in operation for about three years. But back three years ago, actually, we recognized that there is a lack of awareness about assistive technology. So we felt that there's a need to fill in this gap. And hence, we started TechAble. And we, as mentioned earlier, we gather like-minded people to innovate and benefit persons with disabilities in Singapore. But that is, does not stop at the physical centre level. So we also uh, respond to queries from various um, universities, etc., and companies who are keen to use their expertise to actually come up with new solutions. So we actually provide the consultancy and input to them. Right? So since we started, right, we have assessed and trained more than 900 people with disabilities, and we outreach to more than 30,000 people through various avenues. And also, we also supported more than 10 local enterprises to develop their figures, sorry, develop their products further, right? So to drive the innovation in the ecosystem, we have, we, I mean, we have various means, other than outreaching, out, outreaching to the other companies uh, in the local domain, we also um, use grants, as I mentioned earlier, to actually drive ground initiatives. So one for, for example, we have the Topbot and Living Life Initiatives Grant, where we actually encourage organizations throughout Singapore to actually submit their proposals, and we will evaluate them and try to support them as much as possible to move to a ready to go to market or even go to market level, so that they can be sustainable and continue to benefit local persons with disabilities. And at the same time, we also engage government agencies to to recommend and to suggest the use of universal design in the design of the infrastructures, for example, and also in the application of assistive technologies to make the whole government service more accessible. And on the raising awareness of technology, um, we, I mean, we have our usual outreach channels like you know, the, all, the, all the online channels, etc., events, but we also run workshops, mainly to targeted at the person with disabilities to raise their awareness. So as an example, uh, on your right, the photo on top actually shows a smart home workshop where we highlight the use of smart home devices in the context of a person with disability. And at the bottom, we have a captioning workshop to highlight the importance of captioning as a service to a person with hearing impairment. So um, there's a video on Tech Able, but I'm not playing here in the interest of time. But uh, actually, this link is actually available on the fact sheet for Tech Able on the Zero Project website. So if you are keen, do go to that fact sheet and, down, and follow through, and you can have a glimpse of what the Tech Able Center looks like. Right? Okay, so in terms of next steps, well, um, Tech Able was set up partly to raise awareness about assistive technology, and so it will always remain a priority for us. 
and we will continue to collaborate with various stakeholders, including government agencies, volunteer welfare organizations, innovators, as educators, therapists, etc., and to encourage them to actually come up with more solutions and encourage the adoption of assistive technology. And on that note, we will also continue to build up our network of stakeholders and to explore new opportunities so as to meet the needs of the person with disability in Singapore. So on that note, um, I mean, for everyone here down on the, in the hall, if you are keen to actually link up and uh, explore co collaborations, do let me know, because I, I walk around, I, th I think I talk to quite a number of people over there as exhibitors. Do approach me if you are keen to uh, explore as, uh, collaborations in Singapore. Right, so to help you along in that, these are some of the contact details. So feel free to um, contact me, drop me an email, reach out to me on LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. We can always discuss more, right? Right, so I'll just give me very short. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Um, there are so many questions that I have just based on that presentation. Assistive technology centers are, are a challenge um, regarding funding and outreach and training. Um, from what I gathered from your presentation, you're serving all disabilities, all ages, pretty much. And that's pretty much, and your training outreach. So I've got lots of questions for you in regards to that. One of them, just quickly, um, do you have a lending library so individuals can actually take the technology away from them and try it before they have to buy it? Or is that something that you're planning on doing? So in fact, we do have that service currently. So as I mentioned earlier, we actually work with a non-profit organization to run the space, and they do operate a loan library. So the loan library actually allows the clients to actually borrow the device home to try or use it in the environment which is meant to be and to assess whether it's useful before actually purchasing the device. So that's a, that's a, uh, that's a loan library. So yeah, we do. Thank you very much. Shigita, you're next. And Shigita, you're going to be talking a little bit about iDragon 4. I want to present myself again. My name is Shigeta Katsuki. And I want to explain about my work. I work for deaf and hard of hearing people who might gain more access to TV programs. This project was started because we had a traumatic experience. 1995, there was a big earthquake in Japan. And during this earthquake, deaf and hard of hearing people could not have access to information. You see the picture there. And there was no captioning, no sign language. So we had the idea to, to give access to TV programs to deaf and hard of hearing people in these situations. Our business has two main components. First, we produce original TV programs for TV, with sign language and captioning. So deaf and hard of hearing people gain full access to the programs. And we work at, uh, sign, uh, at TV broadcasting programs. And we have, we can, we, can, we have captioning and a sign language presented there. This is our product, iDragon 4. And if you use this device, you can have uh, sign language and captioning. I show you a short presentation. It's a film I took from our device in use.
Here you are. So this was the demonstration. So you can see, uh, you can uh, customize your screen according to what you prefer to have to see the captioning or the sign language uh, video. iDragon 4 has additionally an archive of 500 original programs that are accessible to deaf and hard of hearing people who can enjoy the programs. What have we planned for the future? We want to give access to deaf and hard of hearing people on the whole world to information and programs. So we have the program in Japanese and American Sign Language and International Sign, but you can also have it in different sign languages. And we want also to use voice recognition for the captioning. And like this, deaf and hard of hearing people have better access to information on TV. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Shakita. I appreciate you sharing. Um, there's lots of questions I have about the technology, the cost of it, um, how many um, installations that you've actually put out there, but maybe we can save that for the questions. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Okay, next we have Modessa um, talking about affordable hearing aids for everyone. Okay, uh, just as I said before, my name is Modesta and I come from Sole Ear, based in Botswana. Our product is really about addressing the amount of people who are unable to access affordable hearing. Anyone who has a hearing loss is losing their hearing or is hearing impaired knows the cost of using a hearing aid. For developing countries, it often outstrips the income that an, an average family gets. Where the cost of uh, a hearing aid is on average $1,500, solar aid has been able to reduce it to $100. Where we have 60, 624 million people with a, a, a hearing impairment, 66 of those, 66 percent of those in developing countries, only 10 million being produced for the 624 million, less than 10% reach developing countries. Our solution is the solar rechargeable hearing aid. It harnesses the sun's energy or ambient light to recharge a hearing aid battery or to recharge the solar ear hearing aid. This, around this solution is not just a product but we also provide a sustainable business model that will create income and jobs for people who need them. 
it is not a new invention. We don't need to, we don't need to reinvent the hearing aid, but it can be used with 80% of behind the ear hearing aids that are available on the market now. As it is about using appropriate technologies, appropriate technologies for people which are affordable for people who are the majority that cannot, that, that cannot access that affordability. affordability. Our background is that um, the solar charger has been co-founded with people who have hearing impairment. It reduces the cost in that for the rechargeable hearing aid, you don't need to replace it weekly after three days. The battery itself can sustain its charges for up to three years. Therefore, then, the end user is able to reach their break-even in a relatively shorter time. Also, we are promoting the, the, the best practices in terms of reducing the number of zinc air batteries that we throw away by extending the life that we have on batteries. As you know, metals and such are not biodegradable. They are not easy to recycle. This is our network, past and present. We have introduced this product successfully in Brazil, having given uh, free therapy around our empowerment program to over 5,000 children. We have been in China uh, with our partner advocating and having had lobbied, uh, you know, for people with hearing impairment to be able to work in an electronic um, workshop. We are planning to go to the First Natives in America. We are planning to go to Russia. And we're hoping to go to, to Kenya. Right now, we currently exist in Botswana. This is where our hearing uh, impaired technicians are, assembling and distributing the solar ear. So we are looking, obviously, we need to partner with everyone. Like I said at the beginning, planning for disability is planning for all. We're all potentially uh, losing hearing every day. It's part of the natural uh, aging process, and therefore we add on to the numbers that already exist. We would like to see ourselves on every single continent in the world because uh, hearing disability does not discriminate anybody, just like any other disability. And we're looking to work through franchising models for such a technology is easily transferable from the south to the north, north to south, and laterally. It's a, it's a technology that's fairly simple. It's appropriate for many people and can be driven even from the south where we traditionally know, uh, where we're traditionally comfortable with north-south transfers. Um, and this is what our franchise model looks like in the next, uh, probably in the next 10 years. But I'd like to speak more about what DREET means. DREET is the program that surrounds the technology. Technology hardly ever stands on its own without the support. That is early detection of hearing, of, of deafness, research, and development of products, we always need to, re you know, to improve the current uh, technology, but not so far as to make it so inaffordable that it then loses its essence. We're talking about providing equipment. We're talking about empowering people, not just a hearing person, a, a non-hearing person, but also the hearing people. As one of my friends has, was saying earlier, is that. Um, once one person is isolated in society, the rest of society is also in isolation. It just depends on which end you're looking at. Okay? And then therapy, which also comes with uh, pro providing that therapy for families to be able to engage and be able to maximize fully or optimally use the technology in their home for better social existence. So this is just to show where we want to be in the next uh, 10 years and moving across all the way to Australia as well. I don't know why it's not popping up yet, but there we go. Uh, currently, very actively in Botswana and with a head office in uh, Montreal. I am not sure what happened. Anyway, but this is what Solar Ear is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Modessa. Um, there's lots of also questions that pop inside my mind. Um, 
particularly you're at 1.2 um, in sense of revenue right now coming in solo EO. Um, and maybe we could save this for later, but I'm definitely you know, fascinated and commend the company for employing people with disabilities to develop as well as test the technology. So as you expand, finding those individuals, tapping into that resource, I'm sure is going to be challenging. So I'll be anxious to hear possibly your, your thoughts on that when we come back around to questions. All right, thank you very much. Francesca, um, you're next, and you're going to talk about new ecosystem for rehabilitation. Here I am. Hi. Today I'd like to start talking about uh, something that has become an ecosystem but started from a very personal story. So this is my son. This was Mario eight years ago. Uh, I had a pretty tough pregnancy, but when Mario was born in 2011, um, he got uh, the right APGAR index, so it was formally correct. But uh, uh, 10 days when, uh, after he was born, we discovered that he had a stroke. So something that we thought that uh, couldn't happen to an unborn child, but actually happened to, to Mario. And this could have led him to a strong uh, level of disability, like motor impairment, cognitive impairment, uh, or even behavioral, behavioral issues. So it took ourselves as parents a couple of years to understand where we were, uh, which were the supportive network around us. But then uh, we, we found out that uh, we, we could be able to share our story. It was in the first days uh, we were just uh, hiding ourselves, our, our feelings, at a certain point we felt that we, we had to share what happened to us. Uh, starting from this moment when we went to this stage, so from um, time zero to, to time one, uh, when everyone knew about our story, we understood the power of sharing uh, this kind of experiences because people were coming back to us with different solutions and that's why uh, and that's how we understood that uh, the problem that we were facing, it was not only our problem. So we have uh, a very big issue. In the case of Mario, he lost uh, almost one hemisphere of his brain. And the solution that we have been able to find in the market were only related to physical rehabilitation, but very basic, so uh, the system was offering to us a couple of hours a week of motor rehabilitation just to let his hands improve. But uh, what we have found during these years was that uh, uh, technology has not impacted the, the area, the sector of motor rehabilitation for people with cerebral palsy at all. And uh, all the solutions that we found in the market were not evidence-based, were not effective, uh, were not designed around uh, our patients. So that's how the Mirable idea came out. We got in touch with a brain prize, so the Nobel of Neuroscience, the person for, that for the first time discovered the mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are these cells that we have in our brain that do activate themselves when we bring an object or when we uh, see someone else doing the same type of actions. So in the case of the children like Mario that are not able, uh, due to the motor impairment, uh, to grab an object, uh, the simple fact uh, that they can observe uh, some specific videos, some other people doing these actions, this could simply rewire this brain. So what we have done during this clinical trial that we ran in, in Italy, for one month we tell to these 20 children that we want to teach them how to become young magicians. 
So the only things that they had to do uh, every day, they stayed in front of the camera, at home, in their own dining room. Uh, they were watching a magician, teaching them some tricks. And suddenly after, they should practice in front of the TV. And the TV was giving them some feedback, thanks to the uh, Kinect 3D camera. And after all, uh, we opened up a channel for uh, uh, communication, and we found out an algorithm to have uh, uh, a, a better match of two kids with the same level of impairment, and then they were uh, learning from each other. So what we have learned from this pilot is that we could build a new ecosystem of rehabilitation and we could offer uh, hope to families with uh, children with cerebral palsy and other type of motor impairment. How we are doing this, we are uh, getting in touch with the families to two main hubs uh, within Facebook closed groups and uh, through a uh, neonatal and pediatric stroke center that we have built in Italy, in which the family go through a uh, free screening. Uh, and then this is when they get into the funnel and when it, they start to have an effective process of, uh, of rehabilitation. So for one month, they have an intensive home therapy. And then uh, twice per year, they go through this intensive summer or sport camp in which actually they just play. Uh, but while they're playing, they're doing the same amount of therapy they're usually having like uh, um, in, in, in 40 hours uh, uh, of half uh, a year of traditional therapy. So I'll go to the replication strategy. Once we have uh, demonstrated that this process has been effective uh, uh, and evidence-based in Italy, what we want to do, we want to uh, try to expand this model all over the world. When we were thinking about the development of the platform, we have been using all the Microsoft technologies that you have heard this morning, uh, starting from uh, AI for accessibility up to the uh, latest uh, machine learning algorithm that we have been used in the, uh, in, in the mirrorable platform. Uh, but uh, overall, we were thinking about a global approach. So also in terms of languages, in terms of availability is this is something that we could take care of. What we are looking for and right now are, is for partners that uh, could be empowered families, association in the local countries that would like to uh, work together with us in order to detect the family need to help them with a new uh, process of, of motor rehabilitation. So, that's everything from my side. Please stay in touch even later because we are also downstairs with our booth, so happy to provide you with more details. Thank you, Francesca. Again, a lot of questions come to mind. Um, um, and and uh, hopefully we'll get some of those questions coming from, from our next segment with all the questions. I am interested um, about the 3D camera and how that actually works. So just briefly talk about that. Yeah, sure. At the beginning, during the clinical trial, we uh, used a Kinect 3D camera. So thanks to Microsoft again, because it was our partner who provided this kind of technology for free, uh, we have been able to go, go into the house of the family and use this camera in order to detect all the kinematic indicators about the movements of the hands and then give fed feedback back to the, uh, to the kids. So for example, when the kid was using the plegic hand, uh, uh, there were uh, uh, clapping hands or uh, signs that uh, were going out, coming out from, uh, fr from the screen. Now in the latest version, in the consumer version, so out of the, uh, out of the pilot, we are just using machine learning. So we are detecting, collecting all this large amount of data, recognize the movement uh, uh, of the end, but we are not using any kind of hardware, just, uh, just software. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, if you have any questions right now, ask any of the panelists. Okay, any, any questions? Ah, I get some coffee in here, get y'all going. Um, I do have a question that I'd like to ask each of the panelists. Um, regarding your high-tech solution um, and your organization, 
what was the most challenging or is the most challenging aspect of that? Example would be finance, financing it, getting people involved and so on. So Alvin, do you want to start? Okay. Uh, all right. So just a very quick one. Um, as I shared earlier, there was a lack of awareness about assistive technology. So for us, the difficult part, interestingly, is that when we tell people about it, they're like, oh, what's this? So it's the, it's the um, how to say, uh, introducing them to assistive technology itself is a little bit of a challenge because they don't know, know exactly what is it about and how to go about doing it. So creating that mind share, is, is, that was a up, uh, up here better. But I must say that, I mean, three years down the road, actually we do have a fair bit of attraction and I see that more and more people are actually more accepting of assistive technology, more interested in assistive technology, and they are coming up to us for more information and inputs. Yeah, so it was a good thing. Uh, thank you for that. I imagine um, the technology transfer of getting trainers that know the assistive technology, since, since you have such a broad offering, serving all disabilities, all ages, could also be a very big challenge, I would think, in transferring that, as well as t for all of you, actually, is that knowledge tra transfer, as well as documentation. How do you make sure that you're document documenting all of this new knowledge so you can grow? So thank you for that. Shagita? What challenges have you faced? Yeah, it is a problem of financing this innovation. We, we need 700 euro for one of these devices. And we try to fund and support the deaf people to buy it. If people want to buy the device, Ninety percent is taken is is funded by the government. The hard of hearing and deaf people get four hundred euro per month yearly every year continuously. But there are a lot of challenges uh, for them. Thank you for that. Um, so funding, definitely a challenge. Okay. Modessa. Well, apart from um, funding as a challenge, uh, coming from having invented this solar rechargeable technology in the South, there's always the perception. Because traditionally, um, with new technologies, new innova innovations, new products, um, the world has always moved in such a direction that it's always been north-south transfer, north-south transfer, and continents in the south have always been known for basket economies and so forth. So on our part, the biggest hurdle is perception, one. Um, then secondly, because of that perception, the challenges become amplified because uh, then we go through a rigorous, um, battalion of questions and inquisitions and you know demands for quality standards and this and that so we always end up working with northern partners to make sure you know at least to be there to enhance and say look we have tested this we've had our products tested through the danish uh, universities with um, through institutions in sweden uh, in germany and of course some other independent audiological tests so every time we bring our technology, we have to bring the whole library of uh, testimonials, so to say. Yeah, thank you. I think that's the most important challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Francesca. Yes, apart from funding, again, uh, the, I think that uh, for those who are uh, dealing with technology in the healthcare system, uh, 
what we are finding uh, really challenging for us is just how to move our technology and our uh, healthcare solution, uh, for example, just around Europe. So uh, we know that European Union uh, uh, has a legislation for which healthcare is a national matter, so it's not uh, a European matter. So that's why uh, if you want to move from a country to another, we need to uh, take care of all the duties that are connected with, uh, with the technology transfer. So I would say this highest level of, of challenge for us right now. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Okay. So my next question is what strategies are you putting in place to address those challenges? Um, what, what, um, if you drill down and really look at what you can do to expand and, and really get to that place where you, you're addressing that, transfer knowledge or whatever that may be, what are some of those um, strategies that you're doing? Francesca, do you want to start? Yes, we, we decided to come here because uh, having the chance of uh, uh, speaking with other stakeholders interested to what matters most to us, so the lives of uh, children with cerebral palsy and their family uh, could make our life easier. So in a very opportunistic world, uh, uh, we do believe that a solution like this could have been transferred uh, just relying uh, on other partner in different countries. So these are the, the, the people we are looking for, the partners we are looking for, and, uh, and, and that's actually why, why we are here. And, and in looking at these partners, um, how would somebody, an organization or an individual, get in touch with you to move through that level, not just to contact you? Yeah. What are the steps? Yeah, we take care of all the technology, the database, the matching of the kids, the, the research, the science behind. So uh, we believe that at this point, uh, the, and, and maybe you have seen in the slide before very quickly, uh, our benchmark could be another case that has been presented here um, last year, that is Discovering Hands, another Shoka fellow who find a solution uh, uh, how to detect Breast cancer, breast cancer in a, in a most effective way. So I think that the model that Discovering Hands has applied, so the ones of uh, um, social franchising, or on the other hand, the licensing model could apply well to this kind of, uh, of, of transfer. Thank you. Modessa? Um, yeah. Uh, just to add to what uh, Francesca said, uh, through um, franchising models, finding partners across the continent in all directions, we have also used um, you know, a strategy to ensure that we partner with leaders in this technology anyway. Existing hearing aid manufacturers, existing uh, battery manufacturers, anyone in the solar industry, uh, but also making sure that, uh, you know, we influence and are able to keep dialogue with regulators, policymakers in the world, such as UNICEF, WHO, um, of whom also did uh, quite a number of testing and they've heard a lot about our product and they, they too have their commentaries on it. Just to let them know what is affordable out there, what is there, that, that we are here to offer a solution to a problem they themselves have said is a problem in the world. So really strategic partnerships, working with both the public and the private sector. Very, very helpful. Um, such technologies cannot transfer successfully or barriers cannot be broken if we just work in the disabled silo, uh, you know, labeling ourselves as disabled. We're not disabilities for all, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, and the question I had earlier in regards to tapping into the resources, finding those individuals as you expand that develop and test on the technology, what, what plans are in the works for that? Um, in the works for testing? Yes, finding the people with disabilities to actually okay. develop and test. All right. Um, well, one of our core values is still and shall continue to be um, 
employing and empowering people with hearing impairment. Um, if any of us are very familiar with any type of disability group, what you will hear is nothing for us without us. And uh, we cannot go against that. We need to join hands and do it together because indeed nothing for us without us. Um, we, have, uh, we have worked with uh, university level trainers in Canada to actually train our technicians to the level that's acceptable to be able to produce such a delicate device. We have worked with trainers in South Africa. We have worked with um, other universities as well through which knowledge is shared, knowledge is given, technical expertise is provided. So it's not, um, it's something that can be, uh, that, that, that has credit. Uh, it has credit and we do take care to make sure that uh, there's quality learning behind the product. So partnerships, cross-regional partnerships is crucial, right? Yes, yes. Cross-regional partnerships, why I said cross-regional is that it's no longer, the world just does not move in one direction anymore. It's no longer north-south, north-south, everything coming from the north to the south. The south certainly has so much to offer to the north, the east has a lot to offer to the west and vice versa. Um, and the more we merge, the more we realize that solutions are not just found in one place but everywhere else. So we're looking to work with everybody because this is an issue that, that is not segregated by border, by creed, by color, by religion. It's just not segregated. Uh, someone in Australia is losing their hearing at 50, 60 years old. Well, guess what? So is someone in the US, so is someone in Mexico, so is someone in Botswana. And this is something that will work for all of us. But one thing we all have in common is that um, we don't have endless resources at an individual level. We're looking for affordable life and dignity. You know, that's what I've enjoyed mostly about this panel is that we're not talking about large organizations here dealing with high-tech solutions. These are relatively small organizations um, addressing these big issues. Um, so challenges. Um, so Shigita, would you like to tell about some of the ways that you're addressing challenges? In Japan, at the TV, we have more captions and more sign language presented. But in other Asian countries, there is a big lack of that. We don't have captions. We might not have sign language interpreters. And we want to mark to sell our product in Asian countries and give other deaf people access to information at TV. This is a big challenge that we have. Thank you very much. Alvin. Right. So, um, yeah, actually earlier on you mentioned about the knowledge transfer, so that's really a, a challenge that we're having here. So, um, currently we are in the phase of uh, codifying the knowledge. So. In the next few months, uh, from our side, we actually will be coming up with a platform and some uh, and a mobile app to actually uh, address this part to meet the needs of the local users. So hopefully that will help in the knowledge transfer part of things. And uh, actually, over the years, we also see uh, somewhat some consolidation of uh, efforts in the assistive technology domains to have a more uh, targeted, more cons uh, succinct direction. So uh, I, I'm not sure how that will turn out in the next few years, but uh, at least the trend is towards more a bit of consolidation, and I do hope that you know, that will help towards the adoption in the coming years as well. So we just have to see how it goes. Right. Thank you. Um, open it up for any uh, questions from the audience. Yes, ma'am, to the right. Yes, sir. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Masahito Kawamori. I'm, uh, I don't have a question, but I would like to add to Mr. Shigeta's comment about uh, challenges and how to overcome. The one of the things that, the, the reason why I'm saying this is I, I, I've been working with his company uh, in the area of standardization. I'm, I'm representing here 
ITUT, International Telecommunication Union. And actually, the, the product that uh, he has just presented is based on the standard from uh, <coughs> International Telecommunication Union. It's the global standard uh, for accessible TV set so that uh, can be used not only in Japan, but also in uh, other countries, uh, including, for example, Ecuador, which is actually uh, testing it, as well as uh, other European countries, as well as uh, Asian and African countries. So one of the, the statist, I mean, strategies to be used to overcome some of those challenges that we, we just uh, observed is to use standardization so that we can have bigger market and uh, lower barriers for technologies and vendors to come in. And I, I think um, his product is the only standardized approach on this panel at this uh, situation, but I would um, recommend that these good technologies from different countries should be considered for standardization if a global market, the global market is to be attained. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, very insightful. Um, so I'm going to point to Francesca, are there any plans? Well, you're using uh, technology as a commodity, so its definition is, is, is standardized by definition. So we are not using uh, personalized technology. Uh, what we are using is a personalized approach. So coming back to brain damage, of course, the outcome can be different uh, uh, on, on, on different people, on different children. So. Uh, of course, we need to use uh, a personalized approach, but uh, the level of technology that we are using is, is the same that you can buy in, an, in a shop, so no, no need to uh, have specific standard in our case. And we've got a hand back up. All right. All right. Thank you, uh, Masahito Kamari again. I also work in the brain and neuroscience area. And as you know, there's no standard there. And all, like MRI, you know, uh, depending on the, the product you buy, you get different results. And sometimes I, I think it would be a good idea to have a standardized approach uh, so to diagnose as well as to exchange information about the, the stat, state of brain, for example. So I, uh, even if you are using uh, commodity products, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're using something interoperable or standardized. So I think it would be an, a good idea to take a good look at uh, what you have and also consider if there is any issue for standardization. Thank you. Um, on the issue of standardization, I think there are already standards for hearing aids. Um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to go that direction again. Standards for the use of hearing aids are already there. Uh, the WHO has guidelines on how to get affordable hearing aids to people in developing countries. Um, a solar rechargeable hearing, uh, the solar charger unit itself uh, is also made according to standards. So I'm not sure what kind of framework in terms of standard you're talking about. If it's in terms of product, it's fine. Uh, but you did bring up a very good point on standardized approach, and I believe this is what we are doing here at Zero uh, Project conferences and working with the various mentors to standardize our businesses, to standardize our approaches to problem solving for the world. Um, certainly, we all have a basic um, definition of what we do, how we do it, and this is what we're fortifying here and taking out to the world. Thank you. 
I want to take a moment and just thank the panelists. You all have been excellent, and um, I've enjoyed this very, very much. Um, I want to thank the interpreters for the work, and this is the completion of the high-tech solution panel. Thank you very much, everyone.